The purpose of this video is to give you just a taste, and it's barely a taste, of what we might call uh, Deuteronomistic theology. This is the theology of the book of Deuteronomy, um, and in particular, um, the theology of a, of a significant strand uh, within the Old Testament. Um, a, uh, a contextual reading of the Old Testament recognizes that, that there are different strands, as it were, within the, the biblical uh, collection of scriptures. This, is, um, uh, this should not be seen as a negative thing. This should not be seen as a problem. It is, in fact, a, uh, a reflection of the great richness uh, of the Old Testament text. The Old Testament texts were not all written at the same time or at the same place. And um, that, that diversity of context allows for a richness that actually makes it possible uh, for the scriptures to speak to different times and places with a directness that uh, would be very difficult if the Old Testament or New Testament were just all gray. In other words, in order to, if, if the scriptures hit all times and all places with equal directness, they would have to be very generalized because the times and places of people uh, are specific. Uh, and so um, without that variation and that diversity of, of biblical texts, we would, we would end up with a very gray and very generalized text. But the fact that the diff different biblical texts are addressed different times and places with greater uh, specificity and with greater characteristicness, that's not a word, with, with greater distinction, um, makes it possible for various writings to jump out at different times and places uh, with greater uh, poignancy and directness than, than others. So there are days like Joshua and there are days like First Peter. But you're not going to have a time when both Joshua and First Peter speak with equal directness, because Joshua is a take the land kind of book, and First uh, Peter is a hunker down kind of book. And so this this diversity within Scripture makes it possible uh, for uh, every time and place uh, to hear uh, God's voice to them with with directness. Now I want to give you a little uh, background here. Um, there, there is uh, discussion among experts on Deuteronomy uh, as to when it reached its current form. I realize that this seems like, what? Uh, well, it's easy. Moses just wrote it, and, and maybe that's the case. Um, but um, when, you, when you go into a little more detail, there's more discussion. Uh, and so let me just um, highlight uh, some of that discussion, and you can do with it what you want. My main purpose is that you're at least aware of these sorts of discussions. So I think probably the majority of Old Testament scholars uh, would equate the book of Deuteronomy in some form uh, with uh, this event that takes place in 2 Kings 22, uh, where the high priest Hilkiah finds the book of the law in the house of the Lord. It's kind of like, what? What's the book of the law? I mean, it's a strange thing. Um, it's as if Israel has been operating uh, without uh, the book of the law for who knows how long. Uh, and, and so it's found, and whoa, we haven't been doing this. Uh, and of course, uh, jo Josiah's reforms are our result. So what is this book of the law? Perhaps our first thought is, well, isn't it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Um, you know, that would be one possibility. Uh, there is, uh, most scholars, again, uh, would, uh, for various reasons, um, equate it with the book of Deuteronomy or some form of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, so this phrase, the book of the law, um, is a, a phrase that is also found in Joshua chapter 1. And there's a literary continuity of the narrative between the end of Deuteronomy and the beginning of Joshua. So there, there is a, uh, in fact, there is a stronger literary affinity between Deuteronomy and Joshua than there is, say, between uh, numbers and Deuteronomy or Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy. So for, in terms of literary style and, and in terms of the narrative, there is this, this um, uh, connection. And Joshua 1.8 talks about uh, Deuteronomy, presumably, or the book that has, it's just left as the book uh, of the law. Uh, and so um, 
there is this this sense, and I'm not an expert on on these sorts of things, so I'm giving you uh, my impressions of discussions gone by. There's a sense that that Deuteronomy at some point may have been uh, uh, more closely connected with Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings uh, than it was with uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Again, maybe that's not the case. I'm just giving you um, uh, some smatterings of a discussion uh, that you might or might not be interested in. And so sometimes uh, these books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, notice I didn't mention Ruth, notice I didn't uh, mention Chronicles, um, or Ezra, or Nehemiah, that Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, uh, I'm sorry, De- Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings seem to form a continuous integrated history um, uh, that that was a, a collection. I'm, I'm not saying First and Second Samuel or First and Second Kings because in the Hebrew Bible there's not a First and Second. When it was translated into Greek and you added vowels, you know, it doubled in size and you needed more than one scroll for it. But there may have been this sense that uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings may have been some sort of a, a uh, literary collection at some point, uh, with Deuteronomy as, as it were, the, the batter off, the, the kickoff batter. Um, and so uh, maybe, maybe again, I'm not, I'm not in any way claiming to be an expert on these matters, but that maybe before Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy were a unit, maybe before that, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings may have been a kind of, uh, of unit. Now, it's, it's clear to me that the his, these history books uh, draw on earlier material, you know, the cycles of, the, of, of Samuel or David and so forth. Um, but uh, this collection may have reached uh, something like its, its current form uh, sometime around the early 500s when Israel, uh, when J- Judah went into uh, to exile. That's about when... Uh, Second Kings uh, leaves off at least. So uh, these books don't, uh, in my opinion, um, show much of the influence of the post-exilic period, um, and especially Judges. There's a lot in Judges that seem. It feels like we're getting a window into some very primitive, very early um, um, theology and and monarchy. Uh, but so anyway, um, this is what people mean when they talk about the Deuteronomistic history. They mean Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, and Kings as a collection um, that may have reached something like its current form around the time uh, that uh, Judah went into exile, and that there is a theological affinity uh, with Deuteronomy um, in these documents, especially Joshua. So, what is Deuteronomistic theology? So, Deuteronomistic theology is the theology of Deuteronomy as it also plays out in the Deuteronomistic history and maybe in some other parts uh, of the Old Testament. Fundamental to Deuteronomistic theology is this exclusive relationship between Yahweh um, and Israel. Um, uh, my my doctor father, uh, James Dunn, wrote about the four pillars of Judaism. Uh, now, um, that's a riff on, I think, the five pillars of Islam, probably. Um, there are others who would talk about three pillars, you know, and so forth. But um, this idea of there being four pillars fits very well, I think, with the theology of Deuteronomy. So we start off with monotheism, or perhaps more accurate, henotheism, uh, because uh, most scholars would say that the Israelites probably believed there was a Baal, they probably believed there was a Dagon. Obviously, they didn't believe that these gods held a candle uh, to Yahweh. They didn't believe that these gods were legitimate. As Christians, we'd probably call these these spiritual forces. We might call them demons. Uh, Paul, you know, um, talks about uh, going to a pagan temple at Corinth as visiting the table of demons. Um, so I don't think it violates Christian thought uh, to view the these other gods in the Old Testament as demonic forces. Uh, but it seems likely to me that the Israelites would have called them gods. Um, uh, so we call henotheism he- heno coming from the Greek word for one, um, would then be the idea that Israel saw um, Yahweh as the only legitimate God uh, for Israelites to worship without denying that there were other deities. You know, you will have no other gods before me seems to imply uh, that there are other spiritual forces out there. So, um, but central to to Deuteronomistic theology is, 
is this idea that there is only one legitimate God, uh, the highest God, El Elyon, uh, for, for Israel. And, of course, there is this sense of election in Deuteronomy as well, that God has chosen Israel uh, out of all the nations of the earth as his. And, and here we remember that uh, in this time, in, in the worldview of this period of history, gods uh, had patron deities. And when you went to war with another country or another tribe, not country, that was, that's anachronistic. When you went to war with another kingdom or another uh, group, that you were going to war with the gods of that, of that group. It wasn't just a physical battle. There was a spiritual battle, as it were, associated with war. And so there's this idea uh, that uh, God, Yahweh, the highest God, uh, El Elyon, uh, has chosen Israel as his, his people. And again, this is, this is part of the theology uh, of, of Deuteronomy. And then the covenant, then, is the stipulations of the relationship uh, between uh, Yahweh and, and Israel. And the focus of the blessing uh, is the land. Uh, these are what uh, Dunn calls the four uh, pillars of Judaism. I think they are, um, uh, at the very least, um, hallmarks of uh, Deuteronomistic um, theology, the theology of Deuteronomy and the theology of uh, the Deuteronomistic history. So um, as long as uh, in Judges, for example, uh, as long as Israel is keeping the covenant, they have the land. But when Israel... Uh, worships other gods and doesn't keep the covenant, God allows them to go into in, in slavery to these other um, kingdoms and peoples. Um, but when Israel then repents, he restores the relationship, he gives them the land back. And of course in, in Joshua, uh, when Israel is being faithful uh, to Yahweh, they can't lose. Uh, but when um, somebody in Israel breaks, the, you know, like uh, Achan, um, then Israel loses. So basically, it's a, it's a very, it's a true theology, obviously true, but it's not a, um, it's not a, it's not as precise as it could be. Uh, for one thing, as I'll, as I'll say in a minute, um, there is little or no sense in Deuteronomy and Joshua that uh, a, a loss uh, could, could happen apart from sin, that uh, Israel will always win uh, if Israel is being faithful to the covenant, and that if Israel loses, then therefore Israel must have violated the covenant in some way. This is true in, in a general sense, but it's not as precise as, say, a New Testament theology, or even the theology of some other parts of the Old Testament, like Job, uh, where we learn that sometimes bad things happen to good people, and they didn't do anything. Uh, so Deuteronomistic theology, as I'll say in a second, has a sense that uh, if you if you serve the Lord, then you're not going to, to face these kinds of catastrophes. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the Shema is, of course, the cornerstone of, uh, of Jewish religion today, uh, and it is central to uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. It is Deuteronomy 6.4. Originally, probably, the sense that the Israelites had was, again, this henotheistic sense. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In other words, uh, that, that Yahweh, as Moberly, Walter Moberly says, Yahweh is to be the exclusive love of Israel. Of course, uh, we now, as Christians and Jews, um, interpret it more as a classic monotheistic statement. Both of these statements are true. Uh, one is, I think, more likely the original meaning of Deuteronomy in context. And then the latter one uh, is the Christian, the most Christian way of reading uh, the verse, uh, an expression of the oneness uh, of Yahweh. Okay, so um, a key dimension I was mentioning, a key dimension of Deuteronomistic theology is this sense that if you serve God, you'll be blessed. If you don't serve God, you'll be cursed. We find this especially in Deuteronomy 28, that you will be blessed if you serve him. So the prosperity gospel, um, again, there is truth to the prosperity gospel because in terms of eternity, if you serve God, you will be blessed eternally. And if you don't serve God, you will be cursed eternally. So there's truth to the prosperity gospel. It's just not uh, as precise uh, as a full biblical theology of, of these sorts of things. And what you'll find is that prosperity gospel uh, teachers, I think, uh, fix their theology on this one strand of Old Testament theology uh, and then forget uh, 
um, you know, the richness of, of Jesus, for example. Jesus, the most righteous person that ever lived, still suffers and dies on the cross. That, that sort of dynamic uh, is not uh, yet expressed in the theology of Deuteronomy or the Deuteronomistic uh, history. It is part of a, biblical, a whole biblical theology, but not a theme of this strand. Uh, the afterlife. There is as yet no understanding of a personal afterlife or resurrection in Deuteronomy uh, or the Deuteronomy mystic history. Yes, um, there is this, this business with Saul and the witch of Endor bringing Samuel back. Uh, but um, this is not, um, there's no, we should probably read that passage more along the lines of, of uh, Odysseus uh, uh, talking to Tiresias um, in, the, in the Odyssey or uh, Virgil, Aeneas, uh, you know, again, and so forth. Um, it's a shadow. Um, um, Samuel is a shadow. Uh, it's, there's no sense of resurrection uh, in any of these texts or of a personal destiny. And so um, justice uh, in the Deuteronomistic strand of the Old Testament uh, is largely a, a matter of this life um, or alternatively with one's descendants. Um, and so um, when Achan dies, uh, he has, as it were, his death has atoned for, for his sin in, in Joshua. There is no sense that Achan goes to hell uh, or heaven for that matter. Th these are not the categories, and this isn't uh, of Deuteronomy or the Deuteronomistic history. For, so in that sense, again, it's, uh, it, the Deuteronomistic history is truthful. Um, it is just not as precise as the whole theology uh, of, of the whole counsel of God, as it were, when we read the whole the whole Bible, um, this is just one strand of the Old Testament. So in Deuteronomy 28, prosperity is a direct consequence of obedience, and cursing is a direct consequence uh, of disobedience. And I've already mentioned the story of Achan. Achan's death, as it were, provides a certain atonement uh, that allows Israel to resume victoriously. Um, there's more to the story, we know, as Christians, and even Jews know when they take into account the whole uh, Old Testament, but this particular strand uh, of Deuteronomistic theology um, does not yet understand that, it would seem, um, or at least it doesn't mention it. And so we, we also find this idea of the sins of the fathers being passed on uh, to, the, to the third and fourth generation. Uh, I, the Lord, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing chesed, uh, faithfulness, uh, covenant faithfulness, loving kindness, uh, to the thousandth generation of those who love me uh, and keep my commandments. Of course, uh, Jeremiah 18 and Ezekiel 31 will say, um, this, from now on, the soul that does the sinning is the one that will die, not the children, uh, but that's uh, for another day. So there's just a little snapshot of Deuteronomistic uh, theology.